cool. Thank you everybody for coming tonight. It's so wonderful to see everyone. It's it's awesome to see so many people out to hear uh, Beth and Paula read. Um, we're gonna start with Beth Mulcahy tonight. Uh, Beth is a Pushcart Prize nominated poet and writer whose work has appeared in over 30 literary journals. She lives in Wooster, Ohio with her husband and two children. She works for a Wooster based company that provides technology to people without natural speech. Beth's debut chapbook, Firmer Ground, was published in April from Anxiety Press. You can find out more about Beth's publications and projects on her website at bethmulcahywriter.com and her free Substack. And I'll link both of those uh, during the reading and uh, take it away. <clears throat> Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and read tonight. Um, yes, so as Jeremy said, I live in Worcester and uh, I love writing poetry. Uh, I also like to write creative nonfiction memoir. And um, as Jeremy mentioned, I do have um, my debut chapbook called Firmer Ground um, came out and it was from Anxiety Press, which is a, a small independent publisher out of Chicago. Cody Sexton um, runs that press and he was wonderful to work with. So it's um, a hybrid book. It is poetry, but also some um, prose pieces that are sort of like creative nonfiction. Um, I really like borrowed form. So I, I do um, what are what are known as hermit crabs. So using different forms like a museum placard and um, board of directors minutes, things like that. So sort of po poetic prose, I guess you could say. Anyway, um, so I have a larger project that I'm also working on related to my maternal ancestry. So a lot of my poetry um, and short pieces are um, have come out of the research and thinking and writing that I have done about my maternal ancestry over the past couple of years. And so the first piece I want to read um, is from Firmer Ground. It's called I Have Something to Say About Potatoes, and it was originally published by Sledgehammer Lit. So it is a culmination of research and imagining that I did about the life of my Irish great-great-grandmother um, and the potato blight in Ireland in the 1840s, just to give you a little context. She was born into that. So there are a lot of lit mags out there, as you know, that have um, sometimes pretty specific themes. And I found one a couple of years ago called Taddy Zine out of England, and they only wanted poetry about potatoes. And I thought, you know, I really like potatoes, but how much is there to really say about them? But the more I thought about it and being entrenched as I was in this research about my Irish heritage, I thought, wait a second, I do have something to say about potatoes. So here it is. I have something to say about potatoes. I love meat and potatoes like a good Irish girl. The tuber ties of my DNA are deep and distant, 177 years and 3,500 miles away, my great-great-grandmother burst fighting into a blighted world from the womb of a woman married to an Irish farmer. Her earliest memories watching her father work land stolen from his father. He was allowed to rent back from absent nobility. Watching potatoes she helped dig out, turn poison and disintegrate to ash in her mother's hands. Watching her mother's tears drown clutched rosary beads. Watching her father look at her like the fairies made her a girl when he so badly needed a boy. Watching the cows march away at gunpoint to be sold for someone else's pocket, for someone else to eat. Watching her people disappear. I'll take mine mashed with salt, butter, and milk, certified Angus beef on the side, and none of it for granted. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. So the next piece is called Queen Anne's Lace. It's about my grandmother, whose name was Anne. And this was first published in um, a journal called Alternate Root Zine. And this one um, is really me working through uh, feelings coming up, bringing her to life as I researched my maternal ancestry and was trying to get to know and understand my grandmother and write her story. Um, so I feel like when we're writing about characters, we have to live with them. And when it 
somebody that you once knew and loved who's gone, it's on one hand, very lovely to spend time with the person, but on the other hand, it's hard because it makes you miss them terribly. So I'm fortunate enough to have a lot of photographs of her from throughout her life. And I study those photos as I write her stories. Um, and I can't know everything that happened to her or how she felt, and that can be really frustrating. But what I don't know, I imagine and create. Um, so here's Queen Anne's Lace. Walking around the arboretum under the hot, bright summer sun, taking pictures of flowers and trees, I saw Queen Anne's lace and thought about what made you happy. When you were here, you were grandma, and we would play I spy with my little eye. Now I see you, a beautiful young woman in black and white photos, jet black bone straight hair curled to perfection every time. I spy someone I miss and I start to cry. I imagine your disapproving look, scowl lipped, shaking head, saying, don't waste your time. It's more than 30 years I'm gone. I see you hand me a tissue, feel your arm around me as you tisk tisk my tears dry. I still feel how it felt when they told me you were gone, like my insides gutted hollow, throbbing and dread. Bringing you back like this, I miss you in a weepy way, like wandering a cemetery, crying for the dead. Driving home, the sky gets dark. Giant drops pelt the windshield until it's hard to see anything at all. I think about the photos, how they remind me what I can't know, and I'm gutted all over again. You look love struck there, but so unhappy here, like you couldn't smile after your love died but you carried on so many years. I wonder what we would have been if I'd ever been more than a kid to you. You would have shown me how to grow things like the flowers we saw today, how to prune roses without getting stuck. It's raining too hard to get out of the car when I get home. You would say, keep your sunglasses on even after the sun is gone. Don't make your tears a problem. Hold your head high and carry on. I spy with my little eye, stoicism in you, building up in me. Thank you. So um, in researching and writing about my maternal ancestry, I have done a lot of contemplating about the mother-daughter relationship that we inherit, like what we inherit and what we pass on. Um, and so this next piece is inspired by my mother and resilience. And it was first published in Second Chance Lit. It's also in the um, chat book, Firmer Ground, and it's called Inhale, Exhale. I sigh all the time. My mother points this out, what feels like every time we are together. She does it too. She tells me that her mother was a sire. It must run in the family. I sigh through clenched jaws at raised voices, marching orders, slamming doors, a methodical numbing to mounting tension. I sigh through nod cuticles, closed lips, silence, shaking my head, nothing's wrong, only everything. The sigh is the body's search, grasping at air, gasping for air, pumping strength into the moment, shifting the weights, readying the forward march. So I let out my sighs one at a time and put one foot in front of the other as my mother did and as her mother did, knowing that no matter what, it is what I would have to do too. The strength of their size are in me I can't get my video. through secrets and wars and sickness. Their size are mine too, filling my heart with resilience and resolve. Mothers and daughters synchronizing size. Thank you. And Jeremy, you're keeping track of time, right? Because I've totally lost track. So you let me know. <laughs> yeah, I'll let you, I'll give I'll let you know. I'll give you a warning. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna continue on the theme of mothers and daughters on these next two pieces, which are both in firmer ground. Um, we're inspired by my daughter. So she loves to call herself my my muse. Um, and in fact, she did the artwork for my chat book um, and my son did a, did a drawing as well. Um, 
And that is something I'm very, very proud of. Um, it means a lot to me about the book that my kids contributed. They're both very creative, they're high school age and very supportive of, of my writing. So um, this first one is called Combat Boots and it was first published by Sledgehammer Lips. My daughter wrestles on her first pair of combat boots for seventh grade. I tell her how others hated mine. Aren't those heavy, they would ask. Don't they weigh you down? I didn't get it. I wrote in my diary how my boots gave me a firm foundation feeling of strength to walk around on, like confidence. Her hands busy with the black buckles, laces, and hooks. My daughter says, there's a poem there. I wonder if she's teasing. We always joke that I see poems everywhere. She pauses, pushes up the sleeves of her oversized flannel looks at me, her sincere eyes the same bright brown as mine. She guides a stray strand of the thick red hair she got from me behind her ear, holds my gaze, nods at my unspoken wondering. There's a poem here, she gets it. Um, so this next one is called Combat Boots 2 because my daughter's combat boots just keep talking to me. Um, and this one was originally published by Olney Magazine. Combat Boots 2. My daughter scrubs dried mud from the soles of her combat boots, fashion boots for seventh grade, with the buckles and the laces and the hooks. I ask her, how did they get so muddy? Oh, she tells me, I had to stand outside in mud during the active shooter drill at school. I don't respond because I don't know what to say. You know, she says, we had a drill because of what happened at the school in Michigan this week. I let out the breath I'm holding and say, I'm so sorry that you had to do that. It's no big deal, she reassures me in her cheerful way. It was only for 10 minutes. I nod and think, but I don't mean the mud. I mean the drill. I mean, you're just a kid, my kid. And it is a big deal that you could be shot in school and we just live with that reality. I'm sorry, it's such a mess. Let me clean them for you. Boots can be scrubbed clean, but some messes feel too big. I'm just another mother, that's all, cleaning mud off boots. Just another mother who doesn't want her kid shot in school. What can I do? These boots aren't actually meant for combat. Thank you. Okay, so, um, as I was talking about before, I write a lot about um, my maternal ancestry, and we heard a poem earlier about Ireland, which was a formative place, but so was Scotland. Um, and I had the uh, fantastic opportunity to travel there last summer to spend time with family there and um, trace my Scottish roots. Um, so this is a poem that I wrote in anticipation of that journey, and it's called An Ode to the Old Country. And actually, it was I wrote this at an Ashland University um, Master of Fine Arts uh, school did uh, their creative writing program, did a community, a free community event. So and I, I live kind of near Ashland University in Worcester and it was a Valentine's Day workshop and we were to be writing love poems. And um, at the time I was very preoccupied with my love for Scotland and my anticipation of that trip. So an ode to the old country is what I, what I came up with. I'm crossing the ocean for you so you will love me as I love you. You are the land of my heart, though we have never met. I have yet to feel your mist on a glen, to ken the lilt of you from the shore of a loch, to spy white wild heather on the bend. You'll welcome me, won't you? My ancestral home with hundreds of lost years of immeasurable kindness in the echoing fuss of uncles and aunties long gone beyond. I'll beg you to tell me who I am, to show me how it was with the family as I wander the paths of my ascendance. 
all imagine life into castle ruins. Find warmth somewhere inside the damp, piercing gales of you. I long to belong to you the way you already belong to me, for you to see me and know me and know that I belong to you. I will belong to you. I was not disappointed, by the way. <laughs> the trip was uh, more than I expected and, and it was a wonderful experience. And I think that um, the next chat book is, is gonna be themed around that trip because there was lots of writing I did in anticipation of it and lots of writing I did um, while I was there and then also processing it afterwards. So that's what I'm working on. All right. Um, how are we doing on time, Jeremy? We okay? Yes, yeah, so you have about five minutes left. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, so this next one I wrote is a is a favorite of mine, and I wrote it um, uh, last um, August while walking around my neighborhood. And we're not quite there in summer yet, um, but we're getting there, right? So this one's called "It's Getting Late." It's getting late in August again. You can tell from the fly-covered mice belly up on the sidewalk and shriveled hanging basket flower pots on porches. You can feel it slap your face if you don't duck from storm-soaked leaves of limbs needing trimmed that hang over the path. You can see it in the height of the corn, of course, and smell it in sharpened pencils and plastic new containers. It's getting late in the day, on Sunday, again, and things can't be held off anymore. So the inevitability of time running out is thick in its film of imminence. But you keep thinking about the white clouds in a dark blue sky at midnight on summer solstice in Scotland. It's getting late in life by now. You can tell by the way your knee yells and the white wiry hair popping up on your head and the way it feels like there isn't enough time to notice things like you should, like really good aged cheddar. It's getting late in the summer now. And the way the air feels when you move through it is like it moves through you, washing into your face with a freshness that makes you take off your glasses so you can fully feel every bit of it on every bit of you while you try to take a picture of the way it feels when the air starts to get cool like this, when it's getting late again. Thank you. Okay, um, so this one is called What These Words Mean. And this is another one I wrote walking around the neighborhood. I guess I, I, guess I get inspired from walking around the neighborhood. Um, what these words mean. These words look like me, but they're only me trying to get to you, like reaching across a world of time and space in one day. These words look like nothing, but they are something more than that. Like waking up when it's still dark and going outside to walk the night into day. And it feels like letting the outside get inside you. These words aren't the same as squeezing hands on a train, but if you read them, they might tell you how I'm struggling today with that feeling, you know? These words aren't enough, but they're all I have. Like watching puddles pool with rain and pretending it counts as living on water. These words may not get me to you, but these words, these words are my only way. Do I have time for one last one? Sure, yeah, you can do one more. Okay, I like to end with this one. So a lot of my, um, well, I've been told that a lot of my poetry is is sort of sad, right? And um, and so I, but I feel like a big theme that I I do write about is resilience, and that's that's kind of one of the points of firmer ground is that um, you know, life gets difficult, 
and there's always things get shaky, but I believe we can always find our way to firmer ground. Um, so resilience, right? And so I like to end with, um, the book ends with this poem. It's kind of me ending on an optimistic high note and it's called On the Way to Work. And I wrote it in the spring. The fog is so thick driving through the valley that I can't tell where the sky ends and the ground begins. The trees are proudly bearing new buds. The grass is long and so wet that multiple large drops of dew are hanging off of each blade. But the blades spring up tall in spite of it, balancing under the wet weight. The sky is such a cool, a is a shade of such cool bright blue that the birds are singing about it from everywhere around, like a chorus of voices taking turns, each doing a different part in a different way at a different time. But somehow, it feels like harmony. The air is heavy with the smell of earth and worms. The new flowers are smiling at me, looking fond of being the first ones to have broken through, standing ready for whatever this day will bring. Thank you. Thank you very much, Beth. Thank you so much. Thank you for reading. Another round of applause for Beth. Please check out her website. Please follow her on Facebook. Um, she, she's relatively new to the Ohio area. Where, where did you live before Ohio? Actually, I've been in Ohio for a long time. I was oh, born sorry. and raised in Michigan. It's fine. I was born and raised in Michigan. Um, and then I've been living, it's okay. I've been living in Ohio, um, you know, probably since yeah, the nineties, but um, I lived in Cincinnati for a long time and then I moved to Worcester and I've been in Worcester for about 16 years. So. Okay. But I'm new to writing again. I just started doing creative writing um, again for about three years ago. I, I wrote a lot when I was in high school and college and studied creative writing and then I got away from it for many, many years. So it brings me a lot of joy and I am um, really happy to, to be here. So thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I have no idea where I got the whole fresh to Ohio thing. I, okay. <laughs> okay. So next up, we have Paula Lambert. Paula has authored several collections of poetry, including The Ghost of Every Feathered Thing and How to See the World. The recipient of the Penn America's Langle Raman Prize for Mentorship, her poetry and prose has been supported by the Ohio Arts Council, the Greater Columbus Arts Council, and the Virginia Center for Creative Arts. Widely published in journals and anthologies, her work has been nominated for several Best of the Net and Pushcart Prizes. How to See the World was a finalist in the 2021 Ohioana Book Awards. Lambert is also a visual artist, small press publisher, and nation liter literary translator. Through Full Slash Crescent Press, she has founded and supported numerous public readings that support the intersection of poetry and science, including Ohio's annual Sun and Moon Poetry Festival, now hosted by the Ohio Poetry Association. Paula, take it away, and thank you for joining us. Well, thanks so much, and it's great again to see you um, again so soon, Jeremy. We were we uh, recorded a podcast a little while ago um, uh, that if you haven't seen, you can take a look at. I know some of you have been on those podcasts too. I'm still catching up on a lot of them, um, but I wanted to. I meant I wanted to start with two new poems because in that podcast we talked about a grief poem. The subject of grief came up somehow, and um, I thought I'd go ahead and I think I have <laughs> this poem finished. Uh, it's one that was overwritten, and I've been paring back and paring back. I read it on an open one, open mic once, and paired back again. So um, uh, we'll see how it flies here. Um, it was really nice listening to Beth, and I was so pleased she ended with the bird poem. <laughs> I keep thinking I'm not necessarily always still writing about birds anymore. I try to keep convincing people I write about things other than birds, and yet birds still keep sneaking in. So uh, we'll see how that happened here. This is called Grief as Tunnel Painted on the Side of a Mountain. Jeremy, in that podcast, we talked about how a lot of poems sort of, we talked about the unconscious, and I tend to try to step out of the way of the unconscious, and a lot of poems come to me really actually very easily. They come to me almost whole sometimes. This one is an example of one that did not. I hadn't been writing in weeks, if not months. It was starting to bother me, and I went back to notes of both dreams and poems I'd started, and I started to say, I wonder if I can 
build a poem here. That's not my normal process. And I think that's why it was overwritten in the beginning and I've had to pare back, but we'll see how this goes. Grief as tunnel painted on the side of a mountain. I review my notes, snatches of dreams that often turn into poems. Here's one, jar of animals, they grow. There are more than I thought. Parrot's beak snaps off in my hand. Snake is actually a giraffe. There's a woman upstairs, fangs out. Of this, I remember only the parrot's beak, black, like a fingernail maybe, waiting to fall off, like a spent blossom. I can feel the vague echo of the break between my thumb and forefinger, the strange stillness of what lay in the palm of my hand, the fearful thought, I didn't mean for this to happen. And who was the woman upstairs, fangs out, angry at me for what I'd done, or offering perhaps what must be plucked from her too, what she had borrowed from the snake, now tall enough to reach her. I can't remember my dreams anymore. Other notes tell me I met Gary Busey on a bus. Conversation just so good, witty, sharp, becomes clear I'll be spending the night. And this, I approach the trail around the lake, heavy with darkness. In that dream, the notes tell me, I can see the moon in the sky above, but follow the sun reflected on the surface of the water. More and more, I think I've been dreaming of my father, woke last week screaming, I love you, as his face retreated into a darkness I couldn't reach. A black hole solid as the one coyote painted on the side of a mesa. Somewhere, a roadrunner. Beep, beep. But not tonight, I'd guess. Or tomorrow night either. Grief can't be called on at will, ordered as if from a menu. Bring me the cheese plate, a steak well done, a salad on the side. Instead, sleep brings us a jar full of animals. A beak that breaks like a breadstick nobody asked for and a woman at the top of the stairs, famished maybe, waiting to fill the hole in her belly, the hole of her heart, ready to consume what's offered, guilt, sin, a glass full of sadness. She knows grief is a jar full of beasts morphing endlessly, chimera, illusion, but so is love as far as that goes, so is fear. She knows fathers never could protect us, not when they were living, not when snakes nipped at their own heels, when they knew birds parrot back, only words they hear from us, and in that strange translation, they lose all meaning. The woman upstairs knows Gary Busey disappointed us all, and Buddy Holly died young before he could. She knows the moon never leaves us that sunlight shimmering on any body of water will always be a path worth following, that light mimics light the same way a tunnel painted on the side of a mountain mimics a great black hole, that we can enter both when we're ready. She knows Gary Busey young was a beautiful thing, that I was too, and you were, and the trail around even a shimmering lake eventually ages us all, disease, dementia, decrepitude. We hold ourselves above the fray, or try to, fangs out, devouring what's ever been good, deflecting what we don't need, knowing one looks just like the other, and so comes back, and comes back, and comes back. Sometimes we enter the tunnel only to be hit by a train. Sometimes, if we're lucky, we realize we've always been that bird. Beep, beep running and running through even a solid black wall, beak intact, coming through just fine on the other side. There are references in that poem, I think you have to be a certain age maybe to catch on to. I don't know how well everybody remembers Gary Busey and that he played Buddy Holly in that movie, but anyway. <laughs> And I thought I'd read too. This is a brand, brand new poem that I wrote just yesterday. And I actually opened it at, I, I read it at uh, Poetry Forum last night. This is the first and only baseball poem I've ever written. But of course, it actually turned into 
a bird poem. I learned yesterday morning and it sent me down that doggone track. I learned, I didn't, I never knew, never knew how many birds have been killed by baseballs <laughs> in both major league and minor league games. So somebody posted something on Facebook and I said, nah. And I looked it up, oh yeah. <laughs> and then I said, you know, one, one link after another and fact checking this and asking more questions. And, you know, it's that kind of um, link to link and video to video and YouTube. And it's a black hole that's either a complete waste of time or, it, or we call it research these, <laughs> these days. So this is the poem that it turned into and it's called An Ideation of Birds. One. Morning Dove, Tucson, 2001, Diamondbacks versus Giants. The perfect death, oh holy death, explosion of stars blown from the body, no matter the corpse raised and ridiculed on its removal, feathers fell like snow. Two, Barn Swallow, Fort Wayne, 2014, Tin Caps versus White Caps. The dull thud, the confused crowd, the silent retrieval. Three, ring-billed gull, Toronto, 1983, Blue Jays versus Yankees. For three innings, the sick bird tottered on the field. The ball bounced once, hit him in the neck, bruised his brain. He hemorrhaged and it was merciful the towel they covered him with, a shroud. Call it a shroud. Four, Morning Dove, New York City, 1987, Giants versus Mets. Fly ball, sun in the left fielder's eyes. All of a sudden, he said, two objects falling. Five, Species Unidentified, Oakland, 2023. Diamondbacks versus athletics. Off day pitching, a curveball caught on camera. No fireworks of feathers this time, no fanfare. The bird, they said mid flight, simply fell to the ground. Six, species unidentified, Cleveland 2023. Guardians versus White Sox. It was a hard grounder, they said. The bird had wandered onto the infield grass, went flying. The batter, standing at first, clutched his helmet and grimaced. Next day, he hit a home run. Rounding the bases and passing third, he raised his palms, hooked his thumbs and fingers fluttering, paid tribute. Hands just briefly become bird. That's my baseball poem, <laughs> and that's brand, brand new. Um, I thought I would read, though, um, since in the podcast we talked about both of the, the two most recent books, uh, Jeremy, I thought I'd read from both of those, because we, we did talk quite a bit about how they came about and so forth, so I'll defer people to the, to the podcast if they're interested in all that, in, in that process, but um, I'll read just a few from here, and I'll start with breath. We talked about how breath is definitely a theme in the book. Um, the botanical, I don't know how well you can see it. The botanical on the front is its baby's breath. Um, anyway, uh, you know, COVID, it, this was very much a pandemic collection. I started writing when um, uh, COVID started in this country, the pandemic started. It's very much a respiratory illness. So this is called breath. This is how the world has always lived, lonely and afraid, each wave of terrible news and intake of breath, sharp, a steel bright sword to our side. The long, slow, angry exhale prepares us for what bitter thing comes next, sunrise, laughter, rain. Crocus, wise and delicate, blooms through death again and again. We can be that bursting. This is how the earth has always lived. This is what it is. Earth cracks open, we reach for light. Darkness comes, we reach for light once more. 
there's a lot the, the I started writing these in about late March into April and then kept going kept going into the summer and sent the manuscript to Larry Smith at Bottom Dog and he said yeah let's you know let's do this so there's a lot about you know when it felt like the whole world was shutting down at the same time outside you know there was so much blooming and growing and and that's um what I was trying to stay mindful of and, and writing about um a lot of people that are here today have heard a lot of these poems, so I'm trying to choose I, that. Uh, but I, I'm going to read this one called Cloistered. Uh, I'm going to read the ones I just like to read. <laughs> to, to read, Cloistered. My son in New York City says the sirens never stop. He's heard as many as five at once. Here in the suburbs of Central Ohio, they're still few and far between. It's the lawnmowers that never end. We've not yet learned to let our grass for a while. I lay on my back on my sun-drenched deck, marveling at how long it's taken me to ask how to love my neighbors when I do not always like them. One mower stops and another further away still roars. It stops and I can hear another. It's a gradual lessening. I count the continual distant hum all the way back to Brooklyn. I've not yet told Christopher about my cousin in Queens. Instead, I let these squawking birds pull me back to where I am right now, cloistered paradise. Christopher is a variant of Christ, aren't we all? My great aunts, cloistered nuns, must have had bad days, sad days. Abbey monks making all those sweet preserves must have pissed each other off plenty. We cultivate silence, I see, so much better now. It's the chance to trace all we feel to its source, forward and back through every generation, across space and time. And this squawking jay, thinking I'm too close, was sent to calm my monkey mind. There are better things to do, he says, than to dwell any place but here. And the breath you're holding. So the, that first poem I read, I said I'd been working on a grief poem. My dad died in 2019, just before, and he died suddenly, and just before the pandemic started. I was able to be there in the funeral, for the funeral, which was lovely. Um, but he, you know, he died in the winter and up north, you know, you're not often buried until the spring. And so I was not able to be home for his burial service, which was really hard because by then the, you know, pre-vaccination, the, the, you know, we couldn't really travel, everything, it was bad, it was hard. <laughs> And so I've just learned, as many people know, if you've lost, a, you know, a parent, if you've lost a child, if you've lost someone close to you, you know, it comes in waves, it comes in waves, and we handle it better, maybe, but it doesn't really go away. So, um, you know, my, you know, an uncle died soon after another uncle died soon after, you know, there were funerals live streamed on Facebook, and who would ever thought some that would ever be a thing, you know, so it, it's been a lot the last couple of years, so I put the whole elder generation passing away. But anyway, that grief poem was very much about my father, and this is about my father. It's called The Breath You're Holding. The man who invented the first reliable mass-produced ventilator was named forest bird. I cried when I learned this. My father, the first person I ever saw on a vent, was also the first I ever saw die. It would be wrong to say a bird couldn't save him. Once, walking in the woods, he let loose his trademark whistle. A mockingbird sang it straight back. My father was transformed. I was witness to the sound. I never saw the bird that day, but when I listen, I can always hear dad. It can't be coincidence that Forrest Bird was an aviator, that he piloted planes when they started to fly so high that humans could no longer breathe. Bird paid attention. He listened to his own calling. Both these things are true. There are not enough vents, there are not enough birds. But when I stand in the forest and listen, every song drifting back is my father and me. Every call is your dad and you. 
The wind in the trees is the same as each cry that ever leapt from our throats. So let's try this. Breathe in deep and slow. Lift your arms out wide. Believe in a bird that can save us. Let the breath you're holding go. Um, and I lost a page marker, so just give, give me one. Yeah, um, let's see. Yeah, so through the course of this, the, those early days of the pandemic, um, I was I was grateful in a way I'd never had been for social media, which, you know, it's always that love-hate relationship with what drives you crazy and on the other hand, what keeps you, you know, in touch with people and so forth. But um, it was really helpful then when we were so cut off in so many other ways to see, oh, this isn't just me. <laughs> you know, other people are suddenly dreaming about their grandparents and thinking about foods they haven't eaten, you know, since they were a little kid. And it was interesting to stay in touch and with other people and find out they'd all been going through the same thing. And you know, I, I, I was thinking and writing about old boyfriends. I was writing about dreams a lot, which actually we were talking about Bowling Green and I studied, um, uh, well, I studied Carl Jung and how approaches to literature and so forth, but with Richard Messer back in the day. And I, I'm still very much into all that in a monthly dream group and so forth. Um, but I ended up writing poems about my first husband. Um, so there are four poems in the book called How to See the World which is the title again of the book, uh, Hunger, Thirst, Fire, and, and Breath. Um, so I'll just read the first one here and then I'll, I'll switch to the other book. So this is called How to See the World Hunger. When I first moved from Massachusetts to Indiana, I didn't know how to see the flat black fields stretching all around me as anything but oceans of mud. It took time to understand the lay of that land, its change of season, and that newly turned soil as black as that held every promise of richness, newness, nourishment, food. I began to see it wasn't quite flat and that not all the soil was so dark, that every rise or mounding, every possible shade of brown was a different kind of soil meant for a different kind of planting. But while it was still new to me, when I felt the first pangs of homesick, a wanting that has never left, I sat down on the edge of one of those fields next to the man I knew by now I was destined to marry. Still blessedly ignorant, I was destined to, to divorce him and gestured hopelessly across the landscape. There's nothing to see here, nothing to look at. The bleakness of what stretched around us matched only the bleakness of what was inside. To his credit, he didn't lash out or take my observation as insult. He said one of the few things I ever thought wise or helpful. I've been to the mountains, he said, and I also thought there was nothing to see. Those mountains were always in the way. So moving to the other book and more, more bird poems. <laughs> I've got time for a few more, I'm pretty sure. Um, Jeremy, you mentioned one. I read one of the um, Vulture poems, the first one in the book um, on the podcast, and I, I didn't read this other one, which you mentioned liking and we talked about a little bit. So Turkey Vulture Committee Kettle Wake. So those are three words, three different words for a uh, uh, a flock of vultures, depending on what they're they're doing. I, th I think the reading the poem takes care of the rest, but that's the title. Turkey Vulture Committee Kettle Wake. I love vultures. Love them. Love them. There are at least four vulture poems in this book. <laughs> Some birds carry a great weight. It's what we ask of them. It fills a need. Doves, we want to be holy. Symbols of spirit so pure, they have power to lift us all. And what will vultures ever be but omens? Something has gone wrong. Somebody has to pay. The committee sits still in the fir tree's branches. We're sure they plan our demise. 
Kettle boiling overhead seems the same slow languid stirring of our own dread, that desperate unnamed need for forgiveness. When we see the wake, we turn away, hide our eyes, damn these filthy birds to hell. Creatures who, unlike us, have never killed a thing, who, unlike us, clean the mess that's left behind. Hear that hiss, that crackle of bone, that licking this world clean. Offer alms to that dark spirit. Pray he comes to your backyard. Pray he comes for you. And then uh, the poem that the title of the book comes from, uh, How History Helps Us Survive Huatzin. The Huatzin is a South American bird, a river bird, and the only bird that's born with uh, claws on its wings. <laughs> So a lot of these poems were based in the, the anatomy of birds. And this, this bird is always, there are actually two, two poems in the book about this bird. Um, so when it's in the nest, um, there, there can be any number of predators in the nest. So the bird will either be tossed out by the, you know, the mother bird or will jostle its way out of the nest and drop down to the river um, you know, for protection. But then in the river, there are also predators. So he's able to sort of swim, make his way to the shore, and he can use the claws to climb the tree to get back into the nest. So that's, that's one of my favorite bird facts ever. <laughs> so this is how history helps us survive Fatsin. When it gets big enough, by the way, it's like the egg tooth, you know, on, on the beak that birds, birds and lizards, anything hatched from an egg has an egg tooth. So these little claws on the wings, they drop off when it's old enough and doesn't need them, when, the, when it's able to fly. When the nestling spies, the viper letting go becomes a kind of grace. God is the ghost of every feathered thing that ever dreamed of drawing breath. God surrounds us. And it's not the splash of the river that tells us we've been saved. It's the sound of what swims toward us, the new danger, the ongoing need to survive. History is older than hope. Newly doused and still missing muscle, the nestling knows this, how to open its wings, how to claw his way back to where he belongs. I have poems about the nictitating membrane, which I can't imagine there are a lot of poems <laughs> about that, generally speaking. I have poems about the eyes, the beaks, the feathers, but gradually they turned into from anatomy poems to these sort of sacred bird mythologies. So um, I'd like to get at least one of those in. Let, let me see which one I marked. About three to five minutes left. Okay, I'm, I like reading this one. It's actually an ekphrastic poem, so we, we, we can do that. Uh, European goldfinch and ekphrastic. So, and the epigraph just says, after Leonardo da Vinci's Madonna Lita, which is a strange, strange, strange painting in my mind because the Madonna is so anatomically off, I think. But there is a tiny, tiny little bird in that painting. Almost an afterthought, near hidden in the shadow of a fat baby Jesus suckling the absurdly placed teat of a smiling Madonna, this tiny bird, bloody headed and aware of its shame, offers us our own absurdities, what we are willing to believe, what we are willing to ignore, worship of creamy white flesh, the sacred feminine misaligned, the sacrifice of children heralded as proof of what we say we believe in. O oh, spirit, icon of death and healing and resurrection, let us pray to believe in you, which is to say us, which is to say destruction and all that comes after. Thanks so much, y'all. Thanks to you, Jeremy. Thanks, everybody. I can't wait for the open mic. I know it's going to be good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Paula. Thank you, Beth and Paula, for reading tonight. You guys are excellent as 
expected. I, I expected nothing less. Just wonderful poetry. Um, we're going to be starting the open mic. It's we got kind of a small crowd here tonight. So if you want to read, pre please let me know. I'll add you to the list. Um, and take a minute for, I don't know, breathing, I guess. <laughs> but, Thank uh, you, Beth. Thank you, Paula. Thank you both. That was wonderful. And of course, your bird poems aren't really about birds, which makes me really happy because my bug poems, I don't think are about bugs. But um, And Worcester is one of my favorite places, Beth. I grew up, I'm not Mennonite, but I grew up Mennonite. <laughs> I grew up Mennonite and and my family was and I grew up in Plain City, Ohio. So Okay, okay. Yeah. So I've been to Worcester a lot and of course I work for OSU now and we've got a creepy campus up there, so Oh, we love we love that. That was what one of those poems was about the um OARDC arboretum, the Seacrest Arboretum there on the agricultural campus from Ohio State. So Cool. So thank you both very much. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we have uh, slated for tonight. Kathy, we can we can add you. Absolutely. Um, there's plenty of time. We have Doc, Jennifer, Carrie, myself, and Kathy. If anybody else would like to share tonight, please, please go ahead. And uh, Doc, why don't you why don't you start us off? How many minutes do I have? Oh, yeah, I should probably establish that. Three minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes. Hmm. Three whole minutes with some generous massaging around the margins. <laughs> uh, any theme? Um, camaraderie or death. I don't know. <laughs> well, this is camaraderie in a sense. <laughs> and it's brand new. Dream quest of unknown love. Questing across unknown seas, beyond horizons of known, beyond where sea meets sky, where lies a land, a dreamland, a land of love's longing, a land where all which is wished, all which is dreamed comes true. Therein lies a city, a city in a glen, a city in a field, a city of swevens, a city called love. It is a city of no more sadade, of no more heroic, of no more longing, of no more yearning, of no more loss, of no more pain. It is a city of unknown love, of love long sought where new love blossoms, where old love blooms, where love is fulfilled in infinite days and nights. It is a city where gods of love live and hold sway. It is a city of peace and of joy. It is an unknown city, a city dream, a city quested, a city called love. Thank you. That'll be all for tonight. Thank you very much, Doc. All right, next up is Jennifer Kern, followed by Carrie Troutman. Hey, everybody. First time here. <laughs> I wrote this poem a couple days ago, uh, July 9th to be exact. Uh, it was my grandmother's 100th birthday that day, and this poem is called Lucille. Today is my grandmother's birthday. She has lived a full century, 100 years of breath and beat, smiles through tears, in sickness and in health. She watched her husband be drafted into World War II. She bore three sons, raised them. She was a homemaker, retired at 95, never lazy, knew her strengths, far from perfect. 
I've despised her most of my life. She played the game of favorites, which I didn't like. She's selfish, often nasty with her words, hard to forgive. And for whatever reason, she's here to testify the history of 100 years. God kept her alive when others have died. Why? I admit, I've asked, receiving no clear answer. She's the epitome of youth, always beautiful, looking younger than her actual years. I'm no fool. I want those Italian genes to favor me too. Lucille is my 100-year-old grandmother who's seen so much and has lost so many loved ones, a century's amount. This makes me feel bad for her. I suppose it's how I love her, through sympathies. I wouldn't be here if she never existed. For that, I'm thankful for her. I often wonder, at the pace she's going, is my grandmother immortal? That's silly, I know, but she could be on track to outlive me. God only knows. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jen. Um, next up, we have Carrie, uh, followed by myself, and then Kathy. Catherine. Kathy, I'm sorry. <laughs> So I'm going to read um, a poem for Beth and one for Paula. So first I have potato exaltation. I scrub little potatoes given from a friend's garden and smell spring rain showers, though it is smoke bloody October. And the sun's rays who I haven't seen in days decide to visit through the chilled kitchen window onto my wet hands. And my skin is of the earth and my friends putting their garden to sleep are of the earth. And the sun, even he drips himself to join the earth. And this God mud is the earth and the earth, my God. And this next one is sort of a bird poem. It's uh, brand new. This is called Mulberries. Scraping to repaint the porch railing, blue jays heckle my proximity to their mulberry tree. The squirrel eats berries branch to branch, shaking loose overnight rain. Church bells chime noon, 13, 14 chimes, 18, 20, and I realize it's two churches, time seconds off each other. How many berries can one squirrel eat in a morning? 12, 40? Jesus could have fed the 5,000 with one mulberry tree and made his blood wine. At dusk, the woodchuck will emerge from his den below the tree stump for berries in the grass. Old rain drips from leaves in carry-on to my scalp as I scrape paint flakes. Jays squawk their purple want. I want crisp white trim against gray siding like last night's storm and mulberry trees full of beaks and paws. But no purple shit on my windshield, no gutters wet with ferment. I want church bells, but no churches. I want a glass of mulberry wine blessed only by beaks and paws, roofs and creation hands, raindrops on every cheek, songs in every branch, and a sky for every voice to sing to, every belly full of purple. Thank you. And next time someone tells me swearing has no place in a poem, I want to point them in that direction because <laughs> expertly placed shit i mean it you can take that phrase out of context if you want but you know it was, it was great <laughs> all right next up we have uh kathy followed by myself and then molly greer did i unmute myself i hope um i think these poem this uh, two poems i think they're both about com camaraderie and death hope that meets your criteria <laughs> Uh, the first one is titled Survivor, and it's for Becky. The pine tree that I rescued from a crack in the sidewalk is now 20 feet tall. We planted it in your yard the summer you began chemo. 
I want you to know that last year it dropped its first pine cones and this year it hosts a nest of robins. Wherever you have gone, we are still here, amazed by the little peach trees that grow from seeds planted by ambitious generation of squirrels. The iris did not bloom this year, but the peonies, those aging ladies in pink negligees were beautiful. I have not trimmed the lilacs as I promised, but I, will, but I will once the blossoms have fallen. In the meantime, all I can say is that we are doing our best to live a life worth dying for. Uh, and this one's a little more whimsical. I asked the caterpillars about meditation. I raise butterflies. Uh, the caterpillars in the garden have eaten all of the dill and are moving on to the parsley. Every morning I go out to ask if they are ready for a hand into the future. And every morning they reply, just a bit longer. But nights are getting cold and I remind them that I've saved a place for them to pass the winter suspended in chrysalis, protected from mice and unseasonal warmth. All I want in return is to ask them how they fold in infinitely upon themselves and go into a meditation so deep that time is no longer a constant. But mostly I want their advice on how to return in the spring as a changeling where everything is familiar, the dizzying mix of sun and shadow, the breeze that stirs the linden, and yet nothing is quite the same. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. All right. Um, I have a poem. This is from, um, I'll be putting up a link to this soon. Uh, the pre-order link is finally up for uh, a book I'm publishing this summer. It's about, uh, it's a collection about Alzheimer's. It's about, um, it's called The Details Will Be Gone Soon. I've mentioned this. I've pestered, I've pestered people about this already. Um, this one's called Waiting for Dawn. And uh, I wrote this shortly after um, I got to visit Nana in the hospital because they're only allowing two people in the hospital at a time. We have a lot of aunts and uncles and cousins. Um, <clears throat> so I wrote this shortly after that event. Waiting for dawn. Moment to moment, and I still pace the hallway. There's mom looking insanely human, frail and fearful and pledged in dark like this. We're in the dark where the details are faint with nothing but her purse and a two visitor maximum and the square styrofoam holding uneaten cafeteria food. It's safe to say the sun's far off now. We're well before the roosters crow. The doctor led us into the room, Nana at the center of a web of wires, pray to the machines, pray to the orderlies, pray to the setting sun. The brow of impending knowledge, chin rested against hollow chest cavity, barely breathing, eyes both sunken and bulbous. She looked more like a corpse brought to life than a living body receding into corpsehood. I held her hand for a bit. It felt too impossibly small to be hers, felt too thin and cold to be alive, till the sundowning began. The rooster won't crow yet. It won't crow for a few more days now, but we'll hear it over Nana's brittle breath. Um, and to end with, a, I have a short poem to not end on something miserable and depressing, but um, this one's called Dogwood Park. It's in uh, North Canton, if anybody's familiar with it. <clears throat> Wind rearranges the vibrant ground cover. Freshly fallen leaves crunch under deer hooves. I watch two younger deer jump a park bench and their mother calmly stroll around the side. Okay. All right, next up we have Molly Greer followed by Roberta Schultz. Hello, everyone. Um, it's my first time here. And um, thank you. Beth invited me. So I was very happy to hear her. And, and Paula, you are absolutely incredible as well. So and thank you for letting me read a couple poems. Um, I'm going to have the first one. I like the idea of having one for Beth, one for Paula. So I'm going to do that. Um, first one is um, this one's for Beth. It's called Synchronized Swimming. Today, I'm planting potatoes, digging trenches and hauling soil from the stubborn pile of compost eroding in the middle of my driveway. I thrust a shovel into the dense earth, rest my sweaty cheek on the handle, 
and gaze across the street at the graveyard on the hill. There's a new pile of dirt on the cemetery grounds, freshly churned red earth towering above gravestones, a somber announcement of a new neighbor. Somewhere, a woman must be crying, or not. She might be hungry, but her body doesn't remember how to eat. In the next room, a man might be praying or cursing. Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. While across town, a little boy sits at his desk in a bustling classroom. He's staring out the window, watching the landscapers plant trees. The teacher's voice is getting louder and she's clapping her hands now, but nothing is more important than watching the piles of dirt rise and fall, like the bizarre dance of synchronized swimmers, breaking the surface with their perfect makeup, strange smiles rising in unison, pausing before the fall, the inevitable descent. The boy wonders what it means when you plant something that's not supposed to grow. Okay. And then I have a bird poem for Paula. <laughs> um, this one is called The Day We Became Birds. I can't recall the exact moment when our fingers sprouted feathers and our hollowed bones took flight, but we, circle, but we fly in circles around each other now, vultures in strange orbit, searching for something we could smell but no longer see. My wings are wide and reaching, but all I feel is the ripple of the wind cut by your wing. You say I love you, but your voice is the mimicking cry of a mockingbird, something borrowed, something blue. That's it, thank you. Thanks, Molly. I'm so glad you joined us tonight. These poems are beautiful. Well, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> Fits right in with all the other excellent work being read tonight. Um, okay, uh, Roberta, you are yeah. up. Bring us home. I'm just going to do one poem, and it's a segue from that Mockingbird. <laughs> Mockingbird, After Sanctuary by Ada Lamone. Suppose it's easy for me to fly from one red bud limb to the top of the United Dairy Farmer's sign and sing there in every dialect I've heard just once, like I tried with that song, Sukiyaki, mimicking the sounds, but this time chirping syllables also right. Even birds from Japan would pause mid-flight to bob respect. You watch me from that liminal perch, wait for a tune worth telling back, flick your bright line tail in a final salute as you spin off riffing, whirs, and clicks. I drive from the gas station twice filled to whistle my shrill notes, and I'll be changed, changed from this creature, Lord that I am. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, Roberta. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to Beth and Paula for reading tonight. Um, I encourage you to check out their websites, you know, get their books, read their work. Um, you can find, you can also find their, their poems through their publications pages. Uh, thank you everyone else who read tonight. You, it was wonderful seeing everyone and hearing everybody read. And yeah, until next month, <laughs> take care everyone. <laughs>